believe in freedom cannot rest. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. But is there one right way to fight for freedom? <laughs> Some call me professor. Others may call me reverend. Some even call me activist. But I wonder, might I be considered a prophetic preacher if I have no pulpit from which to proclaim? What, what good, Greg, is a behind-the-scenes public intellectual? And, and questions continue to beat in as I, as I wonder. Might I call myself an activist if I rarely find a picket line? All of these questions began to turn over in my spirit, and they came to a head. They simmered to a boil on August of 2015. There I was sitting in my office typing. And I started receiving text messages from my friends in the academy, my, my colleagues in ministry, my brothers and sisters who were activists as they all descended upon the show me state and went to Ferguson to memorialize the death of Michael Brown, to turn attention to police brutality and to put a finger on the systemic racism in our country and as they were sending messages back and forth about the teach-ins and the rallies and the marches I began to question why am I here why am I not there who am I the questions continued and then on that Monday August 10th of 2015, one year and one day after Michael Brown's death, all of those questions came to a head. There were 300 protesters. They started out locked arm in arm at Christ Church Cathedral. And they began to march nearly half a mile to Thomas Eagleton uh, uh, Courthouse in St. Louis. And then once they got to the courthouse, their destination had not yet been reached because 50 more persons in that 200 to 300 uh, group, uh, they, they began to step over the barricades. And they stood face to face with police with vest and riot gear. And as I am following this from my computer in my office, I start noticing all of these likes on Facebook, but something did not settle right within me. And then all of a sudden, the picture showed up. The picture showed up. Picture. There, there we go. <laughs> Standing in this picture were my teacher my clergy friend, and my sister. And, and as these questions began to beat in on the waiting moment, I, I had to begin to pull apart this picture and to examine each component piece. First, there was my teacher. You may have heard of him. His name is Cornell West. There he is in his uniform Black suit, white shirt, and black tie. He wore it every day. Pray that he has more than one. <laughs> and you know Dr. West, the social critic, the philosopher whose love ethic always stands on the side of the oppressed. I met Dr. West for the first time in 2004 when I was a member of a doctoral seminar that he taught called the, An Introduction to African American Intellectual Thought. In this particular course, we examined sociologists and psychologists and theorists who, who examined lynchings and, and social injustices and the, the plight of racism in America. And, and as I am sitting at my desk, 
I look at this picture and it, I recognize that Dr. West is not even paying attention to the people standing in front of him. It seems as if he is staring out from that picture and looking directly at me and asking me a question, Greg, where do you fit within the African-American intellectual tradition? Well, Dr. West, I am not Cornell West. I am not W.E.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, Anna Julia Cooper. I am not James Baldwin. I am not, I am not, I am not. But standing to the left of Dr. West is my old friend, Reverend Starsky Wilson. I, I met Reverend Starsky 10 years ago. He was still in seminary. This was when, when, when we talked and dreamed of his, his, his ideas of a beloved community in the St. Louis area. This was before he was named CEO of the Deaconess Foundation. It was before he would be appointed by the governor as the co-chair of the Ferguson Commission. This was before he was appointed as pastor of St. John's UCC. This was long before that. But then on August 9, 2014, Michael Brown died and he laid in the street in Canfield. And that was just 11 miles from Reverend Starsky's office at the Deaconess Foundation. It was just 14 miles away from the church that he pastored. And all of a sudden, Reverend Starsky was mobilized into action. And he represented for me the best of the prophetic preaching to tradition. By day, he, he brought communities together to, to be radically hospitable to the activists who were coming to Ferguson. By night, he stood behind those young millennials in the Black Lives Matter movement, and he held his hands, and he prayed on their behalf as they chanted, Why are you in riot gear? We don't see no riot here. And Reverend Starsky stayed there and prayed. But I'm at my desk. I am not Reverend Starsky. I am not Tracy Blackman. I am not Martin Luther King. I, I am not Gardner C. Taylor. I'm not Teresa Frau Brown. I am not. I am not. I am not. But that's just my teacher and, and my old preaching buddy. But then standing next to them is my little sister. <laughs> And I, I wasn't, I was confused. I, I didn't know if I should be more shocked that she's standing in front of police with weapons and bulletproof vest, or should I be more shocked by her T-shirt <laughs> that says, this ain't your mama's civil rights movement. Rahel, Tesfamere, and I, they, we're not biological kin, but since we first met, we knew that we would be interrelated for life. And so it was no surprise to me after she graduated from Yale that she would start an online magazine to articulate the problems of culture and faith and, and injustice. It, it was no, no surprise to me that she would begin to articulate the positions of the Black Lives Matter movement on a national stage as a columnist on the Washington Post. It was no surprise to me that she was there, but as I began to ask questions, I thought, I am not Rahel Tesfamarian. I'm not Stokely Carmichael, Asada Shakur. I am, not, uh, I, I, I am not Darnell Moore. I am not in the Black Lives Matter movement. I am not, I am not, I am not. What does it mean to continue to define your vocation by who you are not? When do we begin to concretize who we are and how we will fight for freedom. 
troubled by these questions, I turned to another teacher of mine by the name of Howard Washington Thurman. In 1949, Dr. Thurman wrote this very important book, a small book that uh, researchers say that Martin Luther King, he carried two books with him. One was the Holy Bible. The other was Dr. Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited. If you haven't read it, go pick it up. So in 1949, Dr. Thurman offers his biblical interpretation of why Jesus is aligned with the underprivileged of the world. And he makes three important arguments here to connect Jesus' ministry, his life, his work, to those whose backs are against the wall. He first says, that Jesus was a Jew. Scripture tells us that Jesus came from a very devout family. His parents would make the annual pilgrimage to the festival of Passover. We also know that a 12-year-old Jesus would sit, and I talked to Brother Spinrad about this, Rabbi Spinrad. I, I, I also know that Jesus would sit down in the temples with the, the, the teachers and, and engage in the old radical rabbinic teaching method of asking questions in the temple. Jesus was a Jew. But not only that, Thurman says that Jesus was poor. We know from his origins that Jesus, when he was born in a manger, his parents, they wanted to offer a sacrifice on his behalf, but they could not afford the sacrificial lamb. They could only afford a dove. Jesus was poor, and Thurman believed that it's important for us to recognize that he was attached to all of the poor people, the masses of poor people on this earth. But not only that, Jesus was a member of a minority group <laughs> in a more dominant society. Research and history tells us that Palestine was overtaken and taxes were raised and temples were destroyed. And if there was any thought of insurgency, it was stuffed out with force. Did that knock out my? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I get, I get into this stuff. It, it was snuffed out with force. So here we have young man Jesus wrestling with his identity of how he will be a freedom fighter. Thurman says that there are two options for him, to resist or not to resist. And he says that there are two forms of non-resistance. The first he calls assimilation. And he believes that the Sadducees gave Jesus this example in his time. The Sadducees were willing to bow their knee for security and for self-interest in order to maintain their status. But not only that, in, in bowing one's knee, you also place your, yourself in a position to shun your beliefs and your, your faith and your customs and your heritage. I have a question for you. In your fight for freedom, have you shunned what is most important. What were the costs, the benefits? The second group that Thurman says is among the, the non-resistant are the cultural isolationists. He refers to this group as the Pharisees, the persons who would step away and, 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 and distance themselves from the oppressive regime so as not to be further tainted. According to Thurman, this type of distancing not only creates a, 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 a barrier between you and others, it also creates these feelings of resentment and bitterness and, and hatred and fear. Have you ever tampered your tongue? Have you ever turned your head to maintain your sense of selfhood? What were the costs, the benefits? Then finally, 
Thurman says that there are also those who were overtly resistant, the zealots, who believed that forceful action was required to put the oppressor back in the oppressor's place. But we got to recognize that even the zealots were a minority group, so they recognized that death may be the cost of their resistance. And the thing that Thurman really teases out in his work is that these zealots believed that if you were complicit, if you were complacent, if you were not with us, you were against us. Therefore, I ask this final question. In your pursuit for justice, have you placed a binary in your life to say that if you are not with what I believe, you are against everything I believe. Jesus wrestled with these three identity crisis, vocation questions. And Thurman says, as he walked out of that desert, clarity came. I must contest Rome but I am not a Sadducee. I am not a Pharisee. I am not a zealot. I am not, I am not, I am not. Well, Jesus, who are you? I am the way. I am the truth and the light. I am the bread of life. Jesus begins to model what a new vocational outlook might be through these declarative statements. Thurman sums it up in a seven-word rule that aligned Jesus with a different way for the remainder of his life. The kingdom of God is within us. That's six words. Doggone it. Okay, the kingdom of God is within us. And so Jesus sought to reclaim the inward center. And by reclaiming the inward center, he's recognizing that no external force can break the spirit of a person unless their inner life is compromised. So he seeks to reclaim the acreage of the soul and transform it such that even in his ministry, he can scribble in the dirt and stand on behalf of a woman in adultery. He can stand before a Roman soldier and minister to him. He can even go to the graveyard and talk to the man that's rattling chains and ask them questions. Who are you in light of this? So back to my own questions that began to tremor in my soul as I typed for weeks, for months, for, 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 for almost a year. I wrestled with these questions. Who am I? Who am I not? And then it dawned on me. You can read about it in a book, shameless plug. Then it dawned on me. I am an artist. I don't paint pictures. My wife would tell me, you really don't sing. <laughs> but I create space for hard, heartfelt conversations through this group, this organization, this movement called Fearless Dialogues. So on this night, in this place, I leave you with two very important questions as Rome is surrounding us. Who are you? Not who are you not. Who are you? And how? How will you fight for freedom in your most authentic way? Thank you. <laughs>